through the Bible looking at um, things that validate what the Bible says. And uh, our first stop around is obviously the creation. And uh, as we go, we'll you know go with that. We're going to go looking at the different reigns of the kings of Israel, um, making sense of the different dates, um, because at first glance it does look like a lot of the dates are wrong, so we'll, we'll go through and look at that. Um, and then we will go through and look at uh, archaeology that, that finds and confirms different things from the Bible. Um, we'll look at different uh, other historical texts like what Babylon has to say about stuff and whatnot. And uh, just kind of help you to see how the Bible fits into um, global history. Um, and then we'll go through through the New Testament too. Obviously, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on books like, oh, I don't know, Revelation. <laughs> because it's all a vision. So we're not going to find much archaeological uh, proof for a vision. <laughs> you know, obviously. But anyways. Okay, so our first stop along the way is uh, creation. Genesis 1, 1 through 2. Um, I know that says 2-7. That's a typo. Just ignore that. It's actually 2-3. Now, there are – people say – I don't know how to say this. Um, so there are two different um, creation ideas. The first one is found in 1-1 one, one through 2-3. The second one is found in 2-4 and onward. Um, so we're going to look at each of them in at one at a time, uh, starting with Genesis uh, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and uh, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the spirit of, the spirit of God was moving uh, over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the night, I'm sorry, the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. Then God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters from which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, there was morning, a second day. Now, heaven here, think more sky. Okay, not, not heaven as in like the place that you go when you die. Um, then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. So God called the dry land earth, and the, um, and the gathering of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said that the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind, and God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning a third day, verse 14. Then God said, let, the earth, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens uh, to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give them to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made the great, uh, the two great lights, the greater light to, to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning a fourth day. Then God said that the waters teem with swarms of living creatures. And let birds uh, fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarmed after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. There was evening and there was morning, a fifth, a fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth uh, bring forth living creatures after their kind. Cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you of all I'm sorry, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be good for you. I'm sorry, food, food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to every um, thing that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. When God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts. 
By the seventh day, God completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So, obviously, we want to try and understand what the Bible is trying to teach us rather than trying to argue our modern scientific ideas or disprove modern scientific ideas. That's not what our purpose is. And this is where we have to say thank you to people like Ken Ham who have really tried to validate the Bible. However, we have to break from people like Ken Ham because they try and make the Bible say something that it's not trying to teach. Um, it's all good and well, but like, for instance, if you're familiar with Ken Ham, he was the one who did the, built the ark in uh, Kentucky or wherever. Um, one of the things that he did is he argues fiercely that the, there were dinosaurs in the ark, which – I'll show you over the next couple of weeks that there was no dinosaurs in the ark. But just, in uh, fact, they actually did have a lot of dinosaurs in the ark. Yeah, I I know. That's my point. He has he ha he argues this all the time, and in his exhibit on the ark, he has a bunch of dinosaurs. That's what, That's what she's talking about. Yeah. She actually went and saw the ark in wherever that is, Kentucky or whatever, and there are actually dinosaur models on the ark to show that dinosaurs were on the ark. But well, let's look at one thing at a time, okay? okay? However, you do not have to go to the other extreme that a lot of people do, like, for instance, Richard Dawkins, and just come to the complete opposite. We're going to look at how there is actually sufficient reason to believe that there was a flood, yes. um, that there is sufficient reason to say that to believe that there was a Tower of Babel. We're going to look at all that stuff. But um, we're going to have to do it in little, little pieces, okay? So first question that should come to mind is... Is this story supposed to be literal, or is it supposed to be metaphorical? Is it just teaching something that's spiritual, or is it something that teaching something that actually happened? Now, if we look at the whole of the Old Testament, it records actual history, or at least the Israelites believed that it was actual history. So that should bring us to the conclusion that Genesis 1, at least Israel believed it to be history. So it was written to be history. So with that being said, if we're going to look at this as it was meant to be understood, we have to come to the conclusion that we are looking at a historical account of creation. Unless you just don't believe that the Bible is God's authoritative word, which in which case, then yes, you can believe it is a metaphor or symbolism or something like that. But if you're going to take the Bible for what it claims to be, then we're left with the conclusion that Genesis 1 is a historical account of how God actually created the real world. Okay, So then it takes us to the next point. Is it precise or is it analyzed? Now, this is a much bigger question than literal or metaphorical. Now, I can't, I've come to the conclusion that it's literal based on its writing style. Right. If you read in myths and stuff, it's very obvious that it's, it's, it's myth. I mean, it's yeah. just very obvious. But with Genesis, it... it at least the author believed it, so maybe he's fooling himself, you know, whatever. But So, okay, is this exactly as it happened, like he was sitting there watching it happen? Or is it where God revealed what happened and he is simply um, adding commentary to the events? Now, this is a bigger question than it sounds. The book of Judges records history, but it does it through a way of commenting on history. For instance, the book of Judges is not in chronolog chronological order. It's not in the order that it actually happened. His point is to show how Israel was doing whatever the heck they wanted and not listening to God, and they didn't have a king or anything. So he kind of um, orders thing in, things in such a way where it proves his point, climaxing, of course, with Israel getting in a civil war because that really greatly proves his point. Um, the books of Kings and Chronicles, they leave out a lot of history and only really include the things that, that it wants to prove its point. For instance, there was a king called King Omri. He was the father of King Ahab. He was a very important king for Israelite history. However, the book of Kings hardly mentions him at all. <laughs> and when it does, it mentions him in a very poor light, even though politically he was very good. He was just spiritually corrupt. See what I'm saying? But the author of Kings wasn't concerned with history. He was concerned with theology, and he used history to prove his point. Okay? And which, by the way, is another thing that is is unique to Israel. The idea of looking at history through the lens of God working. So anyways, 
So we're left with a bit of a question with Genesis 1. Is it precise or is he simply um, moving stuff around from the way it actually was to give commentary and prove a point? Well, that's not as easy to understand as we would like. It's very unclear. Obviously, it would prove his point very well if he was trying to show that man is, is special to God. To have man as the climax of the creation, that would fit great. But that doesn't really help us to know if that's if, if he is rearranging things or not. So for that, we're actually going to have to look at science and say, what does science say? And then look at Genesis 1 and say, what does Genesis 1 say? And that will help us figure out if it's supposed to be precise or a commentary. Next, is Genesis 1 exhaustive? Does it mention everything that God did within the creation period? And I don't believe so. I'll give you numerous reasons. The earth is not as old as the rest of the universe. In other words, at the Big Bang, it took a while for the earth to catch up to the rest of things going on. God created the universe before he created earth. But when you get to verse, verses 1 and actually 2, it's not so easy to distinguish what, what's going on there. Um, here's another example. It doesn't mention anything about dinosaurs or large creatures of any kind like that. Um, so we're a little bit lo lost with that. Um, and then also Genesis 1 doesn't describe the creation of the woman as being separate from the creation of man. It talks about it in the same breath. Yeah. Male and female, he created them. Rather than saying, hey, he created male and then he created female later on the sixth day. So we're a little bit, a little bit yeah. be wise to remember that it is not an exhaustive – it doesn't list everything that was done on the six, seven days, okay? Remember that. Next, we come to how long how, – how long did it take for the creation to, to happen? Well, for a long time, it's been argued that we should understand it as a 24-hour period of time, a 24-hour day. There's a problem with this. Um, actually, there's numerous problems. Um, the first is found in chapter 2, verse 3. It says this. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made, but it never ends. So day seven never ends as compared to the other six days. So that should tell you right then, day seven is already over, over 15,000 years old. That's if you go on a young earth theory. But I'm an old earth person, so I'm, I'm believing that the earth is maybe even up to millions or billions of years old. That's a lot. Next, there's the issue of what science teaches us. For instance, the, the sun would have had to hit the earth for a long time to create the metals that we have on earth. Yeah. We're talking about millions of years before it's even possible. So there's that problem. There's a lot of other problems that I really don't want to get too into. Um, but for all the things that he listed, it takes a long time for those things to happen. You know, for instance, he says, let the earth sprout plants. Well, it takes a while for, an, for a plant to sprout and then grow. I mean, that, that right. takes some time. Um, now, what Ken Ham would do is he just simply circumnavigate all of this by saying it instantly appeared in full mature state. And yeah. then anything to do with dating the earth, he just instantly dis disagrees with. So here, let me just kind of – we're going to talk about this more later, but young earth creationists have to go with this. All the, all the dating of the earth is wrong, but, but they don't give us any alternative, scientifically speaking, for the, for the date of the earth. They just make fun of the theory without giving us an alternate theory. So anytime that you hear someone say that the earth is younger than 10,000 years, they are going simply on their own reasoning with no proof whatsoever. And the Bible doesn't teach that the earth is young either, so let's just remember that too. And I'll, I'll show that as we get along, but remember that. So then in 114 it says, Then God said that there be lights and the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So the idea of a segment of day was not even created until day four. So here we have another problem why it can't be 24-hour days because there there wasn't the idea of a day until day four. There was light on day one, but that could have been light from God. It could have been it could have been a lot of different things other than the light of the sun. Uh -huh. 
remember, we're trying to understand it for what it was written as back then, not for a scientific idea for now. Okay, so let's keep on that. So the conclusion there being we don't know how long these periods of time are. Okay, um, and then there's the idea that – so then why would, would the Bible say seven days if it wasn't literally seven days? Because the Bible teaches us a principle of one and seven. Okay. For instance, Exodus 16, 26. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day of the Sabbath there will be none. Okay, so here we have days being the symbolism there. Let's go on to chapter 21, verse 2. If you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve for six years, but on the seventh year he shall go out as a free man without payment. Here we have the symbolism being seven years rather than seven days. Um, 23, 10 through 11. You shall sow your land for six years and gather in its yield, but on the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow so that the needy of your people may eat, and whatever they leave the beasts of the field may eat. You are to do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. So here we have again this, the idea of one and seven. The principle is there, but one and seven what? In this case, one and seven years, or six and seven years, whatever. So then uh, in verse 15... It says, you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days you are to eat unleavened bread. Here we have it incorporated with the feast, yeah. the idea of seven. Um, this goes on into the number of gods, seven, seven, seven. I mean, you see it repeated over and over in Christian history, in Jewish history, in the Bible, the idea of seven being the idea of completion. Um, and it has its own set of, of ideas there. Okay? So... Just because the Bible is trying to teach us the principle of one and seven doesn't mean that uh, that it has to be seven little literal days. It could have been seven times. Okay, let's let's give an example. Let's say that in seven different days, God gave the commands, but those commands took millions of years to be carried out. For instance, day one. Let there be uh, plants that grow on the earth. A million la years later, hey, all the plants that I wanted are there. See what I mean? We don't know for sure if there was any spaces in between the days. We don't know for sure if how long the days were. We don't. Maybe it means seven, uh, seven ages. Now, then the people will obviously say, no, it says seven days. Actually, no, it doesn't. It uses a very generic term, which simply means a span of time. And that span of time can be biblically the same word. A, a, it can be 24 hours, 12 hours, just an age. In fact, if you look at chapter 2, it even says, um, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all, in all their hosts by the seventh day. Okay, then right here. Where is it? It's in chap It's at the beginning of chapter 2. Here it is, verse 4. Whew, couldn't find it at all. This is the count of heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. In the day. That the earth – okay, well, hold on. I thought you just said it was seven days. Now it's one day? It's the same word. It's the same word. So people who are real persnickety about the Bible says it was created in seven literal 24-hour days, there's nothing to base that on. And in fact, at the end of each day, it doesn't say, and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. It says evening, morning, sixth day. Yeah, that's what it says, evening, morning. Yeah. There's a complete difference there. I mean, we can't come to the modern idea of because every time that I, in English, say day, I mean 24-hour days, that therefore Moses must have meant 24-hour days. That's just stupid. Right. That would be putting our ideas back on theirs. Here's another idea. Jewish thought and ancient writing in general wasn't very precise. That's something that we may not like, but they thought different back then, and we just have to deal with it. So where did this account come from and why? Now, this should be a question that very much so bothers us. People weren't here to see this happen. That leaves us a few options. Number one, God told Adam and Eve what happened, or God told Moses what happened on Mount Sinai when he was giving them the law. Or God told people some other time. Okay, here's another option, that people had a vision, and this was the vision that God showed them, in which case we don't know if it was God was showing them um, something specific or if he was showing them everything or if he was showing them not even something that actually happened. So – we're not really sure how to take that. And here's another point following up that kind of important point. God rarely tells us everything. In fact, the Bible says the exact opposite. The Bible says that God hides things because that's his glory. 
And as we try and search things out, that, that's how we get glory, by trying to reveal the things that God has hidden. So the, that should tell us right there that if this was something that God just told to Moses, that he probably left some stuff out. Why? Because he wasn't interested in telling Moses his account of everything he had ever done. He didn't say, hey, Moses, take a pen. I'm going to tell you everything I've ever done. By the way, I've been here for eternity. I've been here right. for eternity. So this is going to take you a really, really long, long time. time. Yeah. For instance, how do we know that God hasn't made other earths yeah. before our earth was formed? And that he went through the whole process of, of redemption oh. through that earth and destroyed that earth and created a new earth? Yeah. We don't know. How do we know that there isn't another Earth in our in our universe in our dimension? We don't know. See, we're we're going on a lot of assumption uh -huh. because we think that we're the center of attention, but it's God who's the center of attention. Yeah. That means we need to not be so persnickety about what we know and what we don't know. So, where did this account come from, and why? Why do we have an account of creation? <laughs> no, I don't believe in aliens. Just to kind of clarify, no, I don't believe in aliens. Check out the other planets. <laughs> but uh, anyways, and so that should bring us with the idea of Genesis 1. Why was Genesis 1 written? And that is important, and we'll come back to that as we continue to look at this. Now, that inevitably brings us to the question of evolution, which... Um, can, can I just say something? Yes, you can say something. Try getting an 82-year-old woman... To admit that it really doesn't matter if it was seven days or seven lengths of time. Try that. First. Yeah, let me just stop you right there. It's pointless. Don't try. <laughs> did you try, friend? I tried once. <laughs> Bet I you never did it again, huh? Finally, I was like, you know what? It doesn't matter. I'm going away. That is exactly a very important point uh -huh. that I should have mentioned. It really doesn't matter how long those seven segments were. So, yes, right. absolutely. Well, go ahead. Gonna go off of that too. You can. It, it, it's a little bit different though. When it says time or uh, day, it's kind of like us saying back in the day. <laughs> it's like it doesn't really matter if it was day or days. It's just like back in the day. It, that's actually you know, a, a that's matter. actually a funny point. We do still use day in a less than literal twenty four hour uh -huh. day period. So it's like it's an invalid point. It's an invalid argument. Or so my day. Every time you hear the word evolution, people are instantly going to come to their own conclusions and they're not going to listen. Yeah. If you're talking to somebody who believes in evolution, then nothing you say will ever dissuade them. And if you're talking to somebody who doesn't believe in evolution, then nothing you can say will ever prove to them that evolution is real. So any time that you talk about evolution, you have to be aware of that half your audience has already put up a wall and does not listen to anything you say. All right. In fact, more than half your audience. The grand majority of everybody who listens to you when you say the word evolution is not listening to you. They know what they believe. They don't want to hear anything separate. So obviously that takes us a little bit a hard time here. Now, here's the, here's, the, here's the real crux of the thing, guys. Most Christians who say that they don't believe in evolution actually believe in evolution, and I'll prove it to you. Did God create the earth with death or no? Not no? With death so then done? species have changed. In other words, species have evolved. See what I mean? Uh, Most Christians say that they don't believe in evolution, but they do believe in evolution because they don't think that there was death in the original creation. So animals changed. Uh, which brings me to a very important point. Who created the lion? So that means he created the created the earth with death, or that the lion evolved from something else, right? We're all in the same boat on this one, right? Right. Because God didn't create any more after day seven, right? Uh -uh. Right. Right. So that would mean either the lion evolved, or, or that the creation was created with death. Well, I don't know. The Bible doesn't really say. But it. But till after the curse. But the but the curse never says that he brought death. And even when God tells him, you will die, Adam knew what that meant. How would he know what that meant oh. if death wasn't a thing yet? Because he never really clarified whether it was die spiritually or die physically. Right. But Adam or Adam knew the idea of, of death. It wasn't an idle threat from God. God Adam knew what he was saying. How could he have known what death was if there was no death? Uh. 
brings us to a very, very interesting poem by William Blake. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I think it's still very important to this. Tiger, tiny, tiger burning bright in the force of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? What made you, O, o tiger? What created you, tiger? That is the idea of this poem, poem, which is interesting because here's the thing. If a lion or a tiger, doesn't matter which, does not eat meat, it will be a very sickly lion or tiger. Yeah. A lion or tiger cannot survive without meat. They were created with the necessity of meat. Try it. Try this project at home. Buy a tiger and starve it of all meat and see how long <laughs> that tiger remains a tiger. In fact, they have shown that humans have developed a certain way because of the introduction of meat to the diet. Now, we know this because in Genesis 9, God says, now you can eat meat. And when we started eating meat, it changed how we as people looked and acted. And if I'll show you something further. If you eat human meat, it will change the way you look and act. So... <laughs> That takes us to a very interesting point here. Was death a part of the curse, or is evolution real? Okay, so here's here's my solution. First off, but if I don't want to upset any carts here, so if you believe in evolution, that's fine. It doesn't really matter. In fact, the Bible allows for it. If you don't believe in evolution, that's fine too. It really doesn't matter. The Bible allows for it not happening either. It really doesn't matter. But I believe that death was part of the creation because first off, God made the lion, and lions eat meat. Second off, because if plants didn't die, the earth would have been untamable and it would have been it would have been death for animals. It wouldn't have worked. Yeah. And plants have to die. Yeah. They have to. Well, didn't God tell Adam and Eve to go ahead and eat from all the creation? Mm -hmm. That means animals too, right? Right. So they had to die too. They had to uh, die. The animals had to die. Right. right? Right. Oh, okay. Now, now I do have to clarify. God didn't give the animals to Adam and Eve to eat, just the plants. Yeah, just right. Just the plants. Oh. Yeah. He didn't give animals until Genesis nine. Animals still ate animals, but people didn't eat animals. Anyways, okay. So you see the problem. So that takes us to the idea of biblical evolution, and that's there's a question mark there. Hua. So we're gonna look at a few possibilities, and once again, I want you guys to come to this with an open mind. I'm not going to teach evolution. I'm not going to disprove evolution. I don't care if you believe in evolution. I want to understand what the Bible says, and I hope you guys do too. So in 112, it says, The earth brought forth vegetation. What brought forth vegetation? Did it just, dis did it just appear? It didn't just appear, did it? It took time. God says, Let the earth bring forth vegetation. Then verses 24 through 25. Now pay attention. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living. Okay, all right. But then it says in verse 25, God made the beasts of the earth. Yeah. It says, let the earth, but then it says, then God. So which was it? Did God make or did the earth bring forth? And the answer is yes. God uses natural processes a lot of the time. Let me, let me kind of clarify. Jamie's a Christian, yes? Okay. Did God supernaturally heal Jamie of her cancer? She's on treatment, right? Kind of my point. Chuck, his kidneys failed. Now, let me, I'll, I'll come back to that because asterisk. Uh, <laughs> they did fail, and he had to have dialysis, yes? So God used something else besides supernatural, yes? yes? Okay. Now, now after that, supernaturally, they have started working again. So that's kind of, an once again, asterisk. And my point not being that God always uses physical things, but I'm saying God oftentimes uses physical things. For instance, what? how did God bring punishment to Canaan? To who? Canaan? The Canaanites? To other people. Ah! Ah! How did God then later bring punishment to Israel after they rebelled? Well, through other people again. He sent Assyria and Babylon, right? You see what I'm saying? Just because God is all-powerful and can doesn't mean that he's always going to do it in the simplest, most direct way. You understand? God is a complicated God. I don't know why he does things in different ways. 
And I don't think I ever will. But luckily, I don't have to figure it out. Okay. So, as far as that, that allows for the idea of some sort of evolution. Now, before you get too carried away, I said some sort of evolution. Not necessarily the evolution that Darwin taught. Okay. This is Darwinian evolution. Without the aid of anything else, things just evolved by themselves to their own means. You see what I mean? That that's not that's not what I'm talking about at all. But there is definitely the possibility of something going on here. Either way, it was not an instantaneous. Uh, it was not instantaneous, but a process. Now we do know that God brought some changes on the earth. For instance, in chapter 2, and we're going to get to this later, it talks about how some plants had not yet started growing by the time that when Adam and Eve were in the garden. So God caused some kind of a change in plant life, or you could say they evolved. Once again, what does the word evolve mean? It means basically in its simplest form, to evolve means to adapt. You as Christians are constantly evolving, Right? You are faced with new problems, and what happens? Do you stay the same person? No. God works in you. You grow or adapt to the situation or evolve to the situation. Now, that's a spiritual sense of evolve, but still. See, the problem is, is that we don't understand what the word evolve means. For instance, all chickens came from a single chicken breed. We still have that chicken breed. It was an island bird. But because of select breeding... We were able to create our own breeds. Leghorn, Rhode Island Red, you go down the list. They're all artificial chickens in the sense that they were not the original bird. We have inbred them. Um, here's another example. Before, there weren't so many dogs as there are now. There were really just a few different kinds, mostly more on the wolf kind of idea. But now we have little wiener dogs. Yeah. We had to backbreed them. Mm -hmm. They didn't exist before. In the creation, they didn't exist. We bred them. Right. See what I mean? Another word of that would be we evolved them. We selected their genes. We bred them. We evolved a new creature. However, what people would have you believe is that evol evolution means, for one thing, a worm, for instance, to turn into a bird. The idea is this, that every animal is doing these little changes genetically micro micro evolution little tiny changes and throughout the course of millions and millions of years these little changes make it where a worm can eventually become a spider or a bird or nonsense like that now just because you are admitting to the fact that things do change okay for instance people are taller now than they used to be that could be called evolution. Am I saying that we came from monkeys? I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying people change over time. Animals have changed over time. We know this. We bred them ourselves. Now, in that sense, evolution is obviously real. But in other senses, that doesn't mean that just because one species has slight changes to it, that evolution as science is teaching it is real. Okay, so I want to give out that. So when I say that I believe personally in evolution... I don't believe in the evolution that, there, that is being taught. I should always clarify that. Which brings me to my real, a really big point here. We have to talk about evolution because evolution is a big topic. But do you have to believe or disbelieve in evolution one way or the other? No. It's not going to matter at all. When you get to heaven, God is not going to care if you believed in evolution or not. He's not going to care. Did you believe through evolution or without evolution that God created everything? Yes. But even that isn't necessarily going to get you into heaven. What's going to get you into heaven is believing in Jesus Christ. You can actually go your entire life believing that the Bible is a book of myths, but have faith in Jesus Christ for salvation and go to heaven. You understand the difference? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, evolution has multiple problems that have not yet been resolved, but that doesn't mean it isn't at least partly true. Now, I, I just kind of clarified this. Let's look at some of the problems with evolution for those people who may maybe do believe in evolution. First off, where does the new information come from? Michael Behe, I think that's how you say his name, uh, wrote a fantastic book recently, and let me just summarize it. There's no real evidence that new information is coming into the genes that would warrant evolution. 
So that's that's a problem, and we have to attribute where is that new information coming from. In fact, it seems like every time that there is a mutation that it only makes something weaker, not necessarily causes something yeah. to become better. So how could a single-celled organism, for instance, turn into a dinosaur? I mean, oh, even over millions and millions of years, it's just not very likely happening. Um, next problem, the Cambrian exp explosion happened too quickly. So if you know anything about science, you'll know that there was this period of time called the Cambrian Explosion where, where pretty much all life that we know came at this one time. Which brings up more questions. What caused this sudden spiral of new plant and new animals, sorry, new animals to start, and why did they stop? See the Bible tells us why it stopped, because God stopped it. It's the sixth day. Okay. But that leaves us with a really big problem because evolution has to take millions and millions and millions of years and billions of years but the Cambrian explosion happened too quickly in time it only took it took way less million years than they theorize it would have had to be and evolution is so unlikely happening it, it, it's it's not it's not was the ratio of it happening is so slim that we're left with a very big question there Next problem, there aren't many in-between species. So if we believe in evolution, there should be in-between species all over the place, right? Yeah. As one species turns into another species, you know, there should be a bunch to warrant that slow, steady progression of change. Right. They don't exist. Even in the supposed, supposed once again, uh, evolution of man from ape, there aren't enough preserved copies of an in-between species because remember... Evolutionists believe that these macro, these huge evolutions happen throughout the course of these minor evolutions. So that means there should be a crap ton of Lucy's, a crap ton of those in-betweens, but there aren't. And then there's a problem that some humans get very close to predating that kind of stuff. Not necessarily, but very, very close, and so we're faced with that problem. And then there's another problem. They aren't ours where they should be. Typically, you'd think of it something like this. The oldest ones will be on the top. The newest ones will be on the top. On the, I'm sorry. The oldest ones will be on the bottom. The newest ones will be on the top. That makes sense, right? Because as they're evolving and as they're dying, they're going into the ground and the ground is moving. Okay, all right. But they're not like that. They're not preserved like that. They're not where they should be all the time. So we have to attribute for all of these problems. And these aren't even all the problems. These are just some of the problems. And we have no answer to these problems. Now, if you read in science textbooks, it's very misleading because they make it sound like we know without a doubt exactly how evolution happened if it did happen. But the truth is we don't know how it happened if it did happen. We don't. They're, they're doing a lot of assuming and just running wild with it. Now, obviously, you know my theories. You know I believe in evolution, but not like they're teaching it. I think they're definitely wrong. First off, I don't think that evolution is a natural process. I do think that God causes animals to change over time, that, to adapt to the new situation. For instance, how many woolly mammoths have you found? Yeah. See what I mean? I do think that God causes things to, to, things to adapt. But to say that I believe that on its own, left to its own devices, nature will just miraculously spring new life with new information, it's just a fairy tale. And we don't have anything to substantiate such a far-fetched claim. If anything, and evolution is real, then that would Im that would more imply a creator than anything. But anyways, once again, there is no final proof for whether evolution is or is not real. There's some things that seem very likely and some things that don't seem very likely. And sometimes scientists who are overzealous for the cause of evolution will just ignore the things that kind of disprove it rather than ask answering it. So it's a mixed bag. It really is. Any questions before we end? We're going to keep looking at different issues with the creation over the next couple weeks. But remember, we are not... Having a lesson next week. What's a big bang? Big. Well, we're going to talk about that next week. Oh. Where'd, you, where'd you see it? What you were talking about earlier. Oh, I was. Oh, I'm. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. That. That was spoiler alert, there, guys. Uh -huh. We'll talk about. It. We are talking about that next week. Not. Not next week. Two weeks. Two weeks. Next week there's no yams. Oh. We're gonna be at the at yeah. the bake at the bake sale. <laughs> we're not talking about next week. Two weeks. <laughs> Any other questions? No. Okay. After you stop the recording. <laughs> <Kidding. laughs>